A retrosynthesis is a plan or strategy for synthesizing a molecule that begins by thinking backward from the target molecule. Let's take a look at an example. So imagine that you want to make cyclohexanol. And the only requirement is that you have to make it from a cycloalkane, any cycloalkane that you want. In a retrosynthesis, we're actually going to begin at the end and ask ourselves a series of questions. For example, we may ask, how do I make alcohols? In other words, from what functional groups can I make an alcohol? And there might be several answers to that question. One answer could be, I make alcohols from alkyl halides. I know that I can do SN1 or SN2 substitution with water or hydroxide to go from halides to alcohols. All right, then I do it again, right? This is an alkyl bromide, and I need to start with just a cycloalkane, so I keep going. I ask again, how do I make alkyl bromides this time? Or from what other functional groups can I make an alkyl bromide? And now, I think I can do that from just cyclohexane, right? And this is a cycloalkane, and so my synthesis, or at least my plan, is done. All right, the last step is after the retrosynthesis is to figure out what reagents and conditions you need to do the forward steps. All right, so those are shown here in green. To do radical halogenation, I treat cyclohexane with NBS and light, and then just SN1 or SN2 substitution to get me to the alcohol. Notice that we're using two different types of arrows here. Right, A double-lined arrow is retrosynthesis, which means thinking backwards. Right? This isn't something you do, right? you're just working backwards. In other words, you're asking, what was the molecule right before this one? And a single-lined arrow, those are the doing steps. This is what you would actually do in the lab to make these molecules. Notice that when I write this out, these arrows are always in opposite directions. Thinking backwards is always opposite to doing. Be careful not to get those confused. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, this seems kind of silly, right? If I want to make cyclohexanol, and I know that I have to start with a cycloalkane, I could have figured out the starting material on my own, right? I didn't need to think backwards. It's obvious I start with cyclohexane. And then through a little trial and error, right, I could have, I could have devised a synthesis to get me to cyclohexanol. Right, and that's fine for these small syntheses that are only two or three steps. But imagine that you had to make something like this. Right, this molecule is huge. It has over 63 carbons. And it would seem impossible to know what to even begin with, what to start with, in order to start constructing this monster. It turns out this is vitamin B12. And this was a synthetic challenge. For chemists for a number of years. Um, its synthesis began in 1960. It was a collaborative effort between two research groups, mainly uh, professors Woodward and Eschenmoser. Its first total synthesis was reported in 1972, which involved the effort of over 91 postdocs, 12 PhD students from over 19 nations. Um, and the total synthesis was more than 50 steps. Uh, Vitamin B12 has a corin ring system, that's what you see in blue, um, and it binds cobalt. So we've got cobalt there in the middle. We've got this side chain in light pink here, right? and we can see that it's composed of an amide functional group. We've got a phosphate group here, a ribose sugar, and then this benzimidazole ring system. right? And then flanking the corin ring system, are these six amide functional groups. All right, so where would we start? How would we even begin this? Well, these are the actual starting materials for vitamin B12. 3-methoxyanilin, uh, acetoin, camphor, camphorquinone, um, and you can, all, you can buy all of these from a chemical supply house, right? or you can buy them from the store. But chemists didn't immediately know what to start with. Right? It would be impossible to just begin with these molecules and then randomly through trial and error do a series of synthetic steps that arrived at vitamin B12. Okay, so this is really where retrosynthesis comes in play. Okay, so rather than starting at the beginning here,
We're going to start at the end, right? And chemists recognized right away that they knew how to make amides, right? That's this carbonyl with a bond to nitrogen. And we can make amides very easily from carboxylic acids and amines. So the first retrosynthetic step, right, the first thinking backward step, right, is a disconnection. Right? If I start with this carboxylic acid and this amine, right, then I can make that amide. And so now I really have two new synthesis problems. How do I make the corin ring structure with the surrounding amides here on top? And now, how do I make this side chain in pink? That's two separate problems. All right, from there we continue, right? If we continue from the corin ring structure, chemists realized that they knew how to make these bonds, right? These carbon-carbon bonds right here. Okay, so these were two disconnections that gave me two smaller pieces, right? And they called these the, the, the east and the west ring systems, right? So we've got the east here and the west here Right? And this carbon used to be attached to that carbon, and this carbon to that carbon. Right? So this is a disconnection. Again, I've got two new problems here. And we can see that the synthesis is getting, or at least the, the intermediates are getting smaller and smaller. They're getting more simple. Um, notice that there are also some functional group transformations. Right? They realize that all of these amide groups are on the edge we could get from ester groups. All right, and then this process goes on and on, right? These are now two new problems, right? And I keep working backwards. What bonds, what carbon-carbon bonds do I know how to make, right? That'll allow me to disconnect this molecule into smaller ones. And what functional groups do, not, do I know how to make? Okay, eventually I repeat this process until I end up with simple starting materials that I have in my lab or that I can go to the chemical store and buy. So let's apply that now to a little bit simpler example, right? Hopefully the question on the exam won't be, how do you synthesize vitamin B12? So let's start with this ketone right here, right? And I wanna highlight the two different retrosynthetic steps that you might take, okay? These are called disconnections or functional group transformations. Okay, so for example, I recognize when I look at this molecule that I know how to make methyl ketones, right? This is a ketone, right? And on one side is a methyl group. I know how to make methyl ketones through mercury-catalyzed hydrolysis of terminal alkynes. This is a functional group transformation. In other words, I have the same number of carbons in the final product that I started with. All I did was turn the alkyne functional group into a methyl ketone functional group. Once I have the terminal acetylene here, now I can do a disconnection. I know how to make carbon-carbon bonds through SN2 substitution of acetylides and alkyl halides. In other words, I can make that bond there if I have these starting materials. All right, so that's a disconnection, thinking backwards pulling that molecule apart into smaller pieces. All right, and if I have these pieces on my shelf, I'm done, right? I can do the synthesis. Or perhaps I don't have this molecule on my shelf, or maybe it's not available at the chemical store. Then I have to keep going, right? I know I can make benzyl bromide here from toluene, right? And that's simply a functional group transformation. All right, so that's my plan, that's my strategy. The synthesis then is in the opposite direction, right? So I may rewrite this whole thing, including the conditions and steps that you would take. And I'm gonna start with toluene, or sorry, I'm gonna start with acetylene, form its conjugate base, give me an acetylide, do an SN substitution onto benzyl bromide, right? And then finally, a functional group transformation to turn the acetylene into a methyl ketone mercury catalyzed hydration. And that completes my synthesis. It would have been very difficult, right, especially for new chemists, it would have been very difficult to, to just start with random organic molecules and then try to guess your way to the target, right, this methyl ketone right here.
All right, we can also see here that some synthetic plans are divergent. In other words, the plan allows you to take different endings to make different molecules. In this example, we can see that I can make both this primary alcohol and the secondary alcohol from a common intermediate. Right? This is styrene, an alkene. Okay, styrene itself, this alkene, I might imagine or envision making that carbon-carbon double bond through a simple E2 elimination of an alkyl bromide. And the alkyl bromide I can make from ethyl benzene through radical halogenation. Right, so I've got steps in common to both alcohol, right, but I diverge at the end right, to give me two different products. Again, the last step is always to determine the forward conditions. That's opposite to thinking backwards. Right? And so to get to the common intermediate, I do a radical halogenation with NBS and light. Right? And that happens preferentially at the benzylic carbon. That's where I'd form the most stable radical. Then I would do an E2 elimination. Right? That gives me the alkene. And then from here, if I want to make the primary alcohol, I do hydroboration oxidation. This is an anti-Markovnikov addition across an alkene. If I want to make the more substituted alcohol, now I do Markovnikov addition. I would treat with some oxy acid in water, like sulfuric acid in water. In Markovnikov addition, I protonate the least so that I get the most substituted carbocation, and that's where water is going to add. All right, so this is an example of a divergent approach. There are steps in common, but the ending is different. And then finally, there's not always one right answer. Right? So here are two syntheses of the same target molecule, cinnamic acid, shown here and here. Right? And these syntheses look very different. This might not be chemistry that you're familiar with, and that's okay. But recognize that one of these is longer than the other. Right? That top synthesis looks a little bit more, more complex, a little bit longer than the bottom one. But longer doesn't necessarily mean not as good. So this is kind of the beauty of retrosynthesis. Right? You can get creative. Right? Um, you, can, you can come up with a plan or strategy that is unique. Um, and then if you're a real chemist, you've got to ask yourself some questions to decide which strategy or plan is the best. So you might ask yourself, has the chemistry been previously reported? In other words, are all of these steps known? Right? If they are, that really makes your job easier because you have a procedure and some precedent that you can follow. You also may ask, which route is the most efficient and cost effective? Right? The top example, because it's longer, right? and maybe because you start with more expensive starting materials, right? is not as efficient or might cost you more money. Okay, and then finally, what starting chemicals do you already have? Right? Really, if you, if you don't already have the starting materials in your lab, or you can't go to the store and buy them, then a, your synthesis or your plan is useless. All right, so I hope you see the value of a retrosynthesis. Um, it is very tempting for beginning students not to do it. It's easier sometimes to say, I'm just going to guess my way forward. Start with the starting material, and then use trial and error to guess your way forward. And that will usually work if your synthesis is only two or three steps. But recognize that probably in your mind, you're not realizing that you are doing a retrosynthesis. You are thinking backwards. But again, think of that big vitamin B12 molecule. Right? It would be impossible to guess your way forward or even know what to begin with without doing a retrosynthesis. Thinking backwards step by step to get simpler and simpler molecules.